Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first in our webinars as part of the Irish Aquatic Plants Project, uh, sponsored by the National Parks and Wildlife Service in Ireland. Today we have Nick Stewart, who will be introducing us to aquatic plant identification. I'm Sarah Pierce. I'm the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland's Ireland officer. Uh, also with us behind the scenes is Claudia Ferguson Smythe, uh, a wonderful volunteer and excellent aquatic plant specialist as well, um, who will be helping us to answer some of your questions. Now, for anyone who doesn't know Nick, he's an aquatic plant specialist. He's been looking at aquatic plants for, oh, 50 years or so, ever since he was a child. Um, for the last 25 years, he's been working freelance doing extensive surveys for the Environmental Protection Agency, the National Parks and Wildlife Service, and many other groups. He also has done a huge amount of training for different groups, including the Field Studies Council in the UK and, of course, BSBI. Um, he's de developed his own aquatic ID keys, which focus on life forms and have proven to be incredibly effective. Uh, you can download that from our website as well, uh, and he'll be going through that a bit today. And so without further ado, I'll hand you over to Nick. Welcome to everybody. Um, uh, 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 glad, glad you could make, all make it. Uh, uh, today, I just want to uh, give a, an introduction to plant identification, um, uh, uh, aquatic plants. Uh, so uh, I, I will just have a, 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 something of an introduction, just uh, why it's worth studying aquatic plants. Um, uh, where the difficulties, because aquatic plants do have a reputation of being quite quite difficult to do, uh, in my view, unjustified, but uh, we can discuss that a bit. Um, uh, I, I'll uh, talk about what books are available and uh, uh, what tools uh, are useful for, for collecting plants. Um, and then uh, we'll go into the, the main body of the, of the talk, which will be uh, uh, how to identify them. Um, the approach that I'll be taking is to look at leaf form groups, uh, so essentially a vegetative uh, uh, approach, um, and we'll go through uh, those uh, distinct groups, which I'll outline uh, later on, uh, and then I'll talk about some of the key characters within those groups that are useful for identification. Um, so firstly, why is it worth studying a aquatic plants? Well, there are fewer people looking at them, um, so they uh, tend to be under-recorded, uh, which means uh, that uh, it's quite easy to find new and interesting records. So it's quite rewarding having a look at aquatic plants. Um, but these uh, systems are uh, quite complicated, the interaction between um, algal blooms and, and the like, um, and they are very sensitive to the, to the environment, uh, and you'll get a completely different range in, in acid lakes as you will get in, in, in lowland situations. But many of them are declining, and they're actually one of the groups that, that's uh, uh, most under pressure uh, in, in current, uh, uh, the current situation. Um, so it, it is worth, well worth looking out and seeing what's, what's there, what's gone, um, because the, the situation is changing quite a lot. Um, and the reasons for the decline uh, are particularly the, the main threat is enrichment pollution, which is nitrates and phosphates uh, coming from agriculture or uh, from sort of sewage treatment, uh, which don't necessarily take out the nitrates and phosphates, uh, and that can completely change the, uh, the, the, the whole balance of the system. Uh, you tend to get uh, algal blooms, uh, deoxygenation, all sorts of problems. It, 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 I mean, it's uh, like putting fertilizer on a field. It's, it's the same in, in this aquatic environment. It completely changes things. Uh, some of the other major pressures, um, uh, particularly in small water bodies, it is uh, uh, neglect, essentially, um, uh, and uh, ponds infilling with swamp and uh, ending, up, ending up as woodland. Um, uh, <coughs> uh, and uh, um, that, that is particularly a problem in, in, in some areas. 
another quite significant problem, um, uh, and uh, uh, there are a number of uh, introduced aquatic plants that are very invasive and very difficult to control. And this is also having quite an impact in, in, in certain situations. Um, um, uh, and sort of out competing the, the native vegetation. Um, but uh, one of the difficulties with aquatic plants is the uh, is the water barrier, which makes it a lot more difficult to see what's going on. If you take these uh, uh, two situations here, it's quite easy to see uh, which which bog is in good condition and and, and which isn't. But if you do the same with a, a, a couple of lakes, uh, one of these lakes is full of vegetation, uh, the other one has nothing in it, uh, and it's really quite difficult to see. And it's only by getting down in there and having a look that you can actually see what's going on. Uh, <coughs> in fact, uh, it's the top one that has lots of vegetation and the, the bottom one has nothing at all. And it would look, if you took away the water, it would look like that cut over peat bog uh, because there would be just no, uh, very little vegetation over the whole area. Um, uh, there are a few that have nice showy flowers, uh, but there are an awful lot that don't, uh, that have uh, just uh, very small flowers. Uh, this is a pondweed flower sticking up out of the water. Uh, and often the flowers are not terribly helpful uh, uh, for uh, uh, identification. They're quite similar be between related species. Um, so a lot of uh, aquatic plant identification is done vegetatively. Um, uh, if your terrestrial botanist and used to uh, uh, the, the sort of families uh, of terrestrial species, an awful lot of aquatic plants have their own specific families uh, and uh, which sort of stand alone. And, and there are numerous examples, but here are just a few of, of some of the bigger genera that, that are just sort of independent of any terrestrial families. Uh, the other thing is that uh, you can get some of uh, vastly different taxonomically uh, species uh, that have uh, very similar uh, appearances. Uh, uh, here are sort of five examples of, of five very similar looking things but completely unrelated. Um, so the, the approach with aquatic plants tends not to be looking at families but looking uh, looking at the, the, the general shape and leaf form is, is a much more useful approach to to take. Um, uh, just to briefly run through some of the books that are available. Um, it used to be that the, uh, the uh, uh, colour guides that uh, had very little on aquatic plants uh, uh, and uh, they might get a few line drawings at the back uh, as a sort of token, uh, token uh, pointed to the aquatic plants uh, but more recently there are two particularly that have uh, uh, much more inclusive and, and have a, a much better coverage of, of, of the aquatic plant species uh, and these are the wildflower key and uh, the Collins guide. Um, <clears throat> but probably uh, uh, the, this is one of the most useful uh, uh, books if you're uh, uh, getting started uh, uh, it's uh, it's quite an old book now. It, I think it's got a different colour. It's got a green cover now. Um, uh, so there are a few names that are a, a little bit out of date, uh, but it's still a very useful book. Uh, basically, it's an illustrated key. It's got line drawings that, that uh, describe the differences uh, uh, that, it, that it's talking about in, in, in the keys. Um, uh, and it's still a good and uh, uh, inexpensive book. Uh, the Field Studies Council also produced a, a sort of summary uh, uh, of, of that book uh, uh, with some colour pictures, colour drawings, uh, which is also a very useful uh, uh, introduction to, to aquatic plants. 
uh, if you're going into things a bit bit more a uh, bit deeper, uh, the BSBI produces uh, uh, in part of its handbook series. Uh, there are three that are particularly appropriate to uh, that are, that are aquatic plant uh, genera. Um, uh, uh, all of them very good. Um, there are also other ones which, uh, if you're looking at wetland species around, like sedges, which are, uh, are useful. <coughs> so uh, def definitely worth getting those if you're uh, if you're getting into aquatic plants. Um, the plant crib is also another BSBI publication uh, is, is also very good for aquatic plants and, and for wetland plants. Um, it uh, takes <coughs> a number of difficult genera um, uh, and goes into them in more detail and uh, it's still the best uh, uh, book available uh, for water crowfoots, for example, but it also has useful tips for uh, pond reeds and some of the sort of pairs of similar pond reeds, for example. Um, uh, this is uh, perhaps a, a little less uh, well known, uh, produced by Richard Lansdowne, uh, and it's uh, focused at rural plants. Uh, it also includes, which is very useful, um, and is uh, 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 sections on bryophytes uh, and, and on uh, the larger algae. So those are the bits that I, I've uh, particularly well thumbed in my copy. Um, but it also does uh, uh, a uh, sort of vascular plants. The bulk of the book is much bigger. Bulk of the book is vascular plants, uh, and it's very good for. Uh, picking out the differences, but particularly within the families. Um, there's also a very good German book by Klaus van der Weyer, uh, which is, uh, uh, it, it is in German, so, uh, uh, but you'll find that a lot of it, the language is, uh, is scientific language and you just need to get hold of a few words and you, you can uh, still uh, uh, still quite usable even, even if you're not particularly familiar with German. But again, it's another uh, illustrated keys um, it's in two volumes. The second volume is, is, is entirely pictures um, and uh, worth getting hold of. <coughs> um, there's also, uh, particularly because of aquatic plants, uh, tend to be the best books are, are, are distributed uh, uh, between uh, for, for different groups. The best book is, is often a different thing. Over the years uh, that I've been doing sort of um, uh, workshops and uh, I, I've developed a number of keys um, and uh, uh, these uh, ones which are, uh, are available uh, on the BS BR website now <clears throat> and it, I will be running through uh, uh, this uh, uh, the, uh, during this talk uh, and looking at and, and basically uh, the approach is to, to entirely vegetative um, and looking at the different uh, leaf uh, leaf forms. Um, um, <clears throat> for collecting aquatic plants. Uh, there are a number of tools, but in fact, you don't need, you can still look at aquatic plants, uh, uh, particularly at this time of the year. I mean, we're talking about the beginning of September, but for the next uh, month or, uh, or longer uh, is a particularly good time to be looking at aquatic plants because they're often washed up at the edge, particularly as it starts getting windier in the autumn, it will break up uh, the, the beds of weed and you'll start getting stuff and you don't even need to get your feet wet you can just walk along the edge and and uh, pick out all sorts all sorts of interesting things that are washed up on the edge um, but if you're going into uh, in uh, uh, collecting more seriously uh, uh, one thing that you'll probably want to get hold of is a grab which basically uh, it, it's a, a, a piece of wire on a rope that you can throw in and pull in and and uh, and, and see what you've found. Um, there are some that you can buy from sort of fishing uh, organisations, but here are a couple that you can make up uh, very cheaply. 
Uh, the one on the bottom here uh, is made up from uh, a, an egg whisk uh, and just cutting the wires and sort of bending them out. Um, uh, uh, and uh, <coughs> it, uh, very, very inexpensive and, and uh, very effective. Uh, it can be quite light, so if you want to add a bit of weight to it, then you can put sort of metal washers on, on, on the rope and that will give it an extra weight and it'll sink into the, uh, into, if there's dense vegetation, it'll sink into it better. This bigger one is just a piece of copper pipe uh, with bits of coat hanger wire stuck through, sort of bent round at both ends. Um, also very cheap to make, you can use fencing wire as well. Um, and uh, with both of these, the, the, pot, uh, the prongs are quite flexible, so if you get caught on, uh, I don't know, rocks, shopping trolleys or whatever uh, 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 is lurking under the water, uh, if you pull hard enough, the, the, the prongs will bend and you can still bring it in and you'll, you can bend them back into shape uh, before you throw it out again. Um, the, my preference for the rope is, is this sort of um, uh, uh, plastic coated um, washing line uh, uh, string, uh, simply because it doesn't knot quite so badly as, as, as some, some ropes. Um, but uh, that, that's just my choice. Another very useful tool is uh, uh, what's generally referred to as a bathoscope, um, but uh, essentially it's a glass bottom bucket uh, and you can get uh, for not too much, but sort of 30 pounds, you, uh, you, you can get these quite uh, robust um, ones which uh, uh, can be broken down into pieces um, uh, and uh, they're very good particularly if you're in waders or, or looking down on a boat you get a lovely view of what what's growing under the water uh, <coughs> uh, without, without the barrier of the, of the water surface reflecting um, and it's it's good for watching other things too under the water Um, this is another quite useful tool. It's uh, basically a litter picker uh, or a, a, a mobility aid for, for picking things up. Uh, uh, it's particularly useful for ditches where, which aren't so big uh, or it works quite, it works very well uh, in, with a bathoscope. You can look down uh, through the bathoscope and then you can use the litter picker to pick up things that you've spotted through the, through the bathoscope. Now, as I uh, get on to the main body of the, uh, of the talk, um, uh, the, uh, I think the, the easiest approach is to divide the, the aquatic plants into, uh, there are seven leaf form types. Uh, and if you do that, that cuts down possibilities to about uh, uh, a dozen or so species or genera in each group. So it's a good way of cutting down the field of, uh, of, of possibilities and you're left with a, a nice sort of manageable list that, that you can sort of say, oh yeah, I can, I can see it's not that. Um, and uh, I, I think this is the approach which I will be running through in this talk. Uh, so the um, uh, the seven groups are uh, uh, is listed here um, uh, and I will just give you some examples just to show you what I mean by the by these different groups <coughs> um, so the first group are spiky rosettes uh, these are little sort of tufts that are growing on, on the substrate on the bottom or sometimes on the mud just at the edges uh, tend to be quite stiff leaved um, and uh, <coughs> um, a number of, uh, as, I, as I showed earlier, are completely unrelated things that have this, this uh, similar form. Um, and just uh, as an example, uh, 
you, if you download the key, you will get the, the, the list. I'll only do this for, for this, this first group just to illustrate what I mean. Uh, so <clears throat> there are about uh, 10 species uh, or uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that have this growth form. So immediately you cut down the, the field to quite a, a manageable number. Um, and uh, although I'm mainly talking about the actual groups uh, in, <coughs> in this talk, um, you will find in, in the keys that there are more detailed keys which will break down within the groups uh, uh, so, uh, um, so that you can separate e each, of these, uh, each of these species. Um, but uh, in this talk it's, it's not possible of course to go into all that detail but I just uh, want to uh, sort of uh, illustrate the, the, that uh, some some of the characters that, uh, will, that you can use uh, which we'll do a bit later in the talk. So the second group are uh, stringy species uh, which are basically linear narrow leaved species um, sometimes rather grass-like, some, sometimes just sort of, uh, uh, and the, the, the key thing is that they're uh, undivided leaves um, uh, and, <coughs> um, uh, and, and very narrow, thin leaves. Uh, group three is uh, the feathery group, uh, and instead of just having simple in individual leaves, in, the, in this group, the leaves are divided uh, in various different ways uh, uh, into a sort of, a, a sort of lots of lots of leaflets, um, and uh, again, a sort of group of species with, uh, that have, have this. Um, fourth group are the strappy ones. These are. Uh, ribbon leaved ones, particularly you find them in uh, in rivers quite a lot, um, and they tend to be uh, quite long, sort of over 20 centimeters and, and, and more than five millimeters wide. Um, uh, <coughs> okay, and the uh, what are we up to? I think we're uh, group number five are the floaters. These are the ones with. Uh, 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 thick leaves that, that grow on, on the surface and they vary from uh, quite small free floating things like duckweeds and, and water fern um, to sort of medium sized things. Uh, we've got uh, sort of pondweeds and water starworts and water crowfoots um, uh, to water lilies which have, have much the biggest leaves. Um, and they all, all, all the ones in this group, they float on, and the leaves float on the surface. Um, uh, <coughs> and they're sort of quite thick texture. Uh, while the next group, these are uh, mainly underwater uh, species. Um, uh, and they have, uh, they don't have a proper cuticle. Uh, they have this rather stained glass appearance um, uh, uh, to them, uh, quite thin and translucent. <coughs> Um, and there are some quite big leaved ones, uh, and also things like uh, uh, Canadian pondweed and Nussels pondweed, uh, which have uh, a smaller, smaller ones, smaller leaves. Uh, and the final group uh, are a, a group, a sort of rather miscellaneous group of. Uh, uh, a species that grow underwater but have opaque leaves um, <clears throat> and there are only rather few of those um, uh, but uh, and they don't really hang together as a particular good group but uh, uh, they're sort of uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, they form the, the last of them groups uh, and uh, if you can divide them into these groups that will take you quite a long way to uh, 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 narrowing down the field of, of possibilities. <clears throat> there are a number uh, of uh, aquatic plants that have combinations of those. Uh, so for example, we've got a water crowfoot here, uh, and you can see under the water there, there are these uh, feathery leaved uh, 
leaves, um, but when it comes to the surface, you get these uh, floating leaves. Um, so it, uh, you will find that that's uh, listed in both the feathery leaf group and in the uh, floaters. Um, and sometimes they, they, you can see both in combination and that helps you to, uh, to, uh, um, to, to uh, if you know the combinations that, that can help you quite a lot in identifying them. Uh, but uh, quite often you'll find that they're not necessarily together so you may um, uh, uh, Sort of not particularly associate them. For for example, arrowhead, when it starts and particularly in flowing water, it has this uh, ribbon leaved, this it uh, counts as a strappy species. Um, uh, and then when it reaches the surface, it has a floating leaf. Uh, and it's only later on that it develops into the more familiar form of it sticking up out of the water with these. Uh, uh, the, the arrow shaped leaves. Um, so this you will find in the keys as both as a, a ribbon leaf one or a strappy one and as a floating leaf one. Uh, there are um, one or two that are a bit more difficult to fit into the groups but uh, you'll find that in the keys if there's any doubt I've included them in uh, in uh, multiple groups uh, so that they are covered and they'll get picked up. Uh, water starworts, for example, uh, are extremely variable leaved uh, and you'll very often find quite narrow leaves underneath the surface and then when they get to the, uh, get to the water surface uh, they'll produce these uh, wider rosettes. So you'll find that this is actually um, uh, listed under um, uh, <coughs> un under the, the stringy ones, uh, the linear leaved, uh, it's included in the floating group, uh, it's included uh, because the leaves are not particularly clear whether they're translucent or opaque, I've listed them both in the translucent uh, expanded leaves, because uh, the uh, here uh, you, you might call this a tra translucent expanded leaf, um, uh, and also under the, in, in the opaque underwater leaves. So you will find water starworts listed in quite a lot of different places. And it's just a sort of fail safe <coughs> to, to catch uh, how they might be interpreted in different ways. So what I was going to do now was just go through those groups again and talk about some of the characters that that uh, help in in those particular groups. Uh, I won't go through all the characters; just go through some of the key ones, which will hopefully guide you uh, in the right direction of breaking down uh, <coughs> these groups. As I say, uh, if you uh, in in the um, uh, keys that are uh, on the BSBI website, uh, uh, you will find that there are uh, detailed keys for each group which will divide and give uh, a more complete coverage. <coughs> so if we go back to the spiky rosettes, um, uh, these are some of the uh, uh, key characters to look at, the leaf-shaped cross-section root colour can be helpful, uh, and the presence of a blade. There are some rosette species which uh, uh, do actually produce a, a narrow blade. Um, so to give you some examples uh, of, of different leaf shapes, uh, we got a, a, a very narrow tapered pointed leaf here, uh, whereas here we got a mu uh, this, uh, much more parallel sided and, and more abruptly pointed. Uh, leaf, whereas these ones are quite uh, parallel and quite blunt tipped. So these, those uh, will cert certainly help to, uh, to narrow down. Um, <coughs> but one of the, uh, character that is particularly useful, uh, and this is shown in, in the plant crib, is that if you break open, if you break uh, a, a leaf in half and look at the cross section, 
uh, there are very different uh, uh, appearances. So uh, quillwort uh, isoetes, you'll find that it's made up of four tubes, uh, whereas water lobelia uh, only has two tubes. Um, and shoreweed, which is the most common uh, species in this group, uh, it's like looking at a sponge when you break it open. And all wort has a has a, has a solid leaf, so that that immediately uh, you can separate the the different species just by looking at the cross section. Um, <coughs> root color can help. Um, uh, because uh, cool wet tends to have brown roots, where, whereas uh, the, uh, water lobelia and shoreweed uh, have uh, white roots. Uh, one that I don't have here, uh, which, uh, which is in this group, is, is pipewort, which has very distinctive roots. Uh, they look like caterpillars, they're sort of segmented into uh, individual cells and, and, and they're very odd looking roots and are very distinctive. Uh, as I said uh, before, there are some that uh, species that fit into this group because quite often they start off having uh, just a, a, a long narrow uh, blade, but I think you can see just here in these longer ones, uh, they're beginning to expand uh, in, into a distinct blade. Um, uh, <coughs> there's lesser water plantain um, uh, and another one that you may well come across uh, uh, it's not really a, it's more a wetland species than an aquatic species but it quite often gets drowned in, in, in the edges uh, which is lesser spearwort um, and it, it uh, virtually always has some sort of blade to it but, so there is a sort of separate subgroup of, of, of this group uh, which produced a, 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 a lanceolate expanded blade at the, t at the tip of the leaf. Um, also in this group, although I've also included it in, in strappy species, but it's, uh, uh, it's like a, a very big rosette, uh, is water soldier, uh, which has very sort of stiff leaves uh, with sort of spiny edges to the, the leaves um, and it is actually quite a pest in some places uh, it can sort of take over uh, it's quite often an, an introduction although it's supposed to be native in, in parts of Britain anyway but uh, I think in Ireland it's it's always a, an introduction uh, so if we move on to the stringy species um, here the leaf arrangement is uh, particularly crucial, um, whether they're tufted or in whorls or they're uh, uh, in smaller groups of sort of one, two or three leaves together, uh, uh, or, or whether they're sort of alternate and staggered along the stem. Um, the actual uh, cross section of the leaf uh, can also be useful whether they're uh, a solid or whether they're uh, translucent uh, uh, tissue with a, uh, similar to the, the broad leaves, uh, the, the stained glassy appearance of the, of the broad leaf ones, but uh, some of the stringy ones have narrow translucent tissue along, along the leaf. Um, so, <coughs> as I say, you have uh, some which have uh, staggered leaves, alternate leaves, um, uh, uh, Potom geesons particularly uh, uh, come into this group. Uh, there are ones where the, the leaves are grouped together, uh, often sort of twos or threes um, uh, together. Uh, this is horn pondweed. Or uh, there is this very odd form, if you're familiar with uh, bulbous rush uh, on land, it looks completely different when it gets submerged in water. Uh, and becomes the very fine, uh, 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 thin-leaved uh, uh, plant, often green, whereas the land plants are often brown or red, um, uh, and can be uh, can completely throw you when you start looking when you first see it. Um, uh, but the distinctive thing about this one is that it, ha it has these very dense tufts of leaves 
um, which uh, none of the other species in this group have. Um, uh, there are also uh, water starworts, uh, uh, always have their leaves regular in twos, uh, uh, two equal ones. Um, uh, whereas things like uh, the horn pondweed in the previous slide it tends to have two or three or variable numbers of leaves and they tend to be different lengths. In, in the water starworts, the, the leaves are in equal and opposite pairs. And in fact, the only other aquatic plant that has leaves in equal and opposite pairs is this pest species, the swamp stone crop. And the difference is that the, the leaves of uh, water starworts have little notches in the tips, uh, whereas swamp stone crop has pointed tips. Um, so, uh, I mean, that is a, a very characteristic thing of, of the water starworts is that all of them have uh, at least truncate tips or notches in the tips and these equal and opposite paired leaves. Um, and there are ones uh, um, that, <coughs> uh, as I say, the cross section, which is quite difficult to show in, in a slide like this, but, but there are uh, some in this group which have quite translucent leaves, uh, uh, like uh, uh, slender pondweed, uh, there's fennel pondweed, uh, and, uh, which has very solid leaves, um, and uh, there are ones, uh, but if you actually break it, break them open, you'll find that it needs quite a high, a sort of strong mag uh, magnifying glass, but you'll see it's made up of two tubes. Uh, whereas um, uh, uh, floating spike rush, Elegeus uh, fluotans, has a quite a solid flat leaf. Um, and in fact, uh, this, this actually shows uh, another character that's quite useful. Um, it, it, you'll see that the leaf comes straight into the node here uh, in, in this pot of uh, And you'll see just coming up here, there's a, an extra bit of tissue, there's another one there which is called a stipule. Um, and uh, I'll come back to this a bit later, I'll, I'll show, uh, uh, but it's one of the distinctive things about Potomagetans is that they all have alternate leaves and these stipules. Uh, and in, in this one, this is rather un, uh, unique among the uh, Potomagetans, the stipule is actually fused to the leaf, so it actually looks like a sheath, a bit like a grass. Uh, and you'll see um, where you pull it away, you've got a sort of uh, sheathing part, and then you've got a blade, and this is the stipule sticking up, looking very much like a legume. Okay, if we move on to the feathery group, uh, uh, here uh, the, the uh, combination of things to look at, uh, whether the leaves are in whorls or uh, alternate, uh, how the leaves are divided, whether they're forked divisions or whether they're feather-like divisions, uh, and whether they're divided once or, or multiple times. And the, that combination of those three characters will take you to a genus uh, very, very quickly uh, in this group. Um, so to show you some examples, uh, you have here uh, a water milfoil where the leaves are in whorls, um, whereas in the water crowfoots, uh, uh, the leaves are staggered along the stem, they're alternate. Um, and I've also included here a uh, water violet, uh, which does have staggered leaves, but sometimes it, it looks, particularly near the tip of the stem, it can look as though it's whorled. Um, so it, it, it can be a bit confusing that. And I think uh, in the keys that I've actually listed it in, in, in both cases as the world or alternate just to cover uh, that uncertainty. Um, uh, as I say, the, the, the way they're division, the divided is also a very useful character. So here we are, have, have the, the hornworts um, and you can see that the, the uh, leaves are forked, uh, sort of with equal, equal strength to both, both sides of the fork. 
uh, whereas in the mill foils, uh, uh, they're divided like a feather, uh, the pinnate branchings. Uh, um, <coughs> um, and there are ones that ha where there's a, a more complicated forking. Uh, this is a bladder wort, uh, and you can see there's actually a uh, uh, sort of like a feather. It, it has a, a main um, thing going right through. Uh, so the first division is sort of pinnate, uh, and then it starts being furcate as it, as it goes further away. And of course, the very distinctive thing is that uh, it produces these little bladders, these are insect traps, um, uh, or um, invertebrate traps, should we say, uh, uh, that uh, catch uh, little daphnias and things and, and, uh, and digest them in, in these little bladders. Um, and uh, uh, two other ones with more complex divisions. Uh, you've got marsh wort uh, on the left here, uh, which has sort of a two to three times divided and has quite a sort of narrow overall shape to the leaf. Uh, whereas uh, there are two uh, water drop worts uh, with that have uh, underwater leaves, um, and, and this is the feathery water drop wort, uh, Onantia aquatica, which has very complex leaf, sort of three or four times divided. <coughs> and in fact, sometimes you can actually think, oh, is that, is that bit there, that section a leaf, and that's another leaf, and that's another leaf, but actually this is all one leaf. Uh, and you would know that because uh, it would have a clasping base uh, to, to, uh, at the bottom of the leaf. Uh, so we're uh, on to the fourth group, I think, uh, uh, which are the strappy species. And here the things to look at are whether it's got an obvious stem. Uh, quite a lot of these have, uh, uh, in this group, have ribbons that arise completely from the, the base of the plant. Uh, but there are a few things that have an obvious stem to them. Uh, the leaf venation is, is, is very useful for identification, uh, whether they're uh, narrowly pointed or blunt, uh, and whether they're flat or, or spongy. Uh, and again, the combination of these characters will take you pretty quickly to uh, one or two possibilities. Um, so the, the ones that have the, uh, uh, a distinct stem to them um, are, uh, uh, Gra several grasses that are fairly aquatic, like uh, float grass Glycyria, uh, and well grass Catabrosa, uh, and, and they have the typical grass grass form with a, a leaf and a sheath and a, uh, and a ligule. <coughs> um, but also in this group are the uh, pondweeds, uh, again a distinct stem, um, and a, but this time a translucent leaf. Um, and uh, you can see here again, there's the stipule, which is a, a very characteristic thing of, of potomy eating. Um, with the more ribbony ones, uh, particularly useful characters if you look at the cell structure of the leaf. Uh, so this is arrowhead, the ribbon leaves of arrowhead. And you can see a quite a sort of network of veins, and uh, 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 but on a, on quite a broad scale, uh, and then a narrower sort of uh, uh, in, in between those veins, so you can see the sort of cell structure. Um, uh, whereas this one is which is burried, uh, you can see that the cell structure looks like uh, lots of bricks on top of each other very brick-like brick um, uh, structure. Uh, uh, whereas this one has a completely solid leaf and it's actually quite a triangular in section, uh, it is a flowering rush, uh, which uh, you'll be more familiar with it when you're growing out of the water, but particularly in flowing water, you'll find it producing uh, floppy ribbon-like leaves. Um, 
Uh, and uh, one of the things that, that's very useful is uh, also, apart from this solid structure, uh, is that it has a very narrowly pointed tip. Where they don't have pictures of the tips of all these, uh, but uh, <coughs> burries have quite blunt tips. Arrowhead is quite a blunt tip um, as well. Um, this is uh, the underwater leaves of bulrush. Now, again, you're probably more familiar with bulrush as as an emergent species sticking well and truly out of the water, but particularly in flowing water and indeed initially in standing water before it really gets going above the surface you will find these underwater leaves which are, are ribbon-like and have quite a, a narrow uh, a, a cell structure to them and quite pointed tips. Um, the other thing I would also add on, on this one uh, is that uh, the arrowhead, the Sagittaria, it, this, this shape you can see here that it actually uh, gets wider as it goes up and then narrows toward the tips. That's quite a, a distinctive thing too, uh, whereas the other ones they tend to be parallel sided or, or tapered right from the base. Um, so that can be quite useful too. Um, now the floaters, this is probably the largest group um, and uh, covers quite a, a range of sizes. Um, so size is important, whether there are leaf lobes present uh, is important, and the venation is also a very useful character. <clears throat> so uh, uh, we have here uh, particularly the duckweeds, uh, which are very small uh, little discs just floating on the surface. Uh, you can see that there are differences in sizes here. There's probably at least two species of duckweed uh, mixed in there. Um, uh, probably the common duckweed and the uh, least duckweed, lesser duckweed. Uh, so Lemna minuta and Lemna minor. Um, but there may also be other ones if, if you look closely. Uh, but so size is quite important. Uh, we've also got a uh, frog bit here, but I'll come back to that a bit, uh, in a, a bit later. Um, so with the duckweeds, uh, size is, is useful, colour is useful. Um, uh, this is the greater duckweed, which is always purple underneath. Uh, the fat duckweed, which uh, is, is more of this sort of size, the, the lemma minor size, uh, but has uh, sort of spongy cells underneath. That often goes uh, purple as well, uh, particularly later on in the season. Um, and you'll see that uh, out of each of these, uh, these uh, fronds, they're called, uh, uh, each of these discs, there's a, uh, in the lemon minor, there's a single root coming out uh, here. Uh, whereas in the greater duckweed, you have a cluster of roots coming out together. Uh, this one on the left uh, is the ivy duckweed, which is a rather different looking one. Uh, tends also not to float right on the surface, it tends to float just underneath the surface. Um, um, uh, uh, but it has a very distinctive shape that uh, uh, unlike to confuse with anything else. Um, you get even smaller duckweeds. This is the least duckweed. You see this little, these little bubbles on, on the uh, end of my finger there. Uh, that is the, the full size of the plant. Um, uh, and uh, uh, in fact, the best way of actually finding it is, is ro picking up some duckweed and rolling it in your fingers. Uh, and if, it, if they're normal duckweeds, they're, they're scales that just sort of uh, flow over to each other, whereas this is like rolling gra grains of sand. Um, also a very distinctive one in this group is water fern with this very complex uh, 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 leaf structure.
Um, now the lobing of the leaves is is, uh, is a very useful character. So there are a group like common pond reeds here, which are just uh, circular or oval leaves. Uh, 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 whereas uh, an there's another group uh, with uh, where you've got uh, uh, an incision in the bottom of the leaf and two basal lobes. Things like water lilies and uh, the floating leaves of arrowhead and um, uh, and frogbit all have this this incision in the bottom of these two basal lobes uh, and there are a few that have a more complex lobing uh, such as water crowfoots uh, when they produce floating leaves the uh, uh, sort of more uh, uh, sort of uh, lobe right right through right the leaf rather than just at the base. Um, veins are uh, very helpful um, uh, for separating them. Uh, so, for example, here uh, it's not particularly clear, but I can I think you can see uh, that there's a herringbone arrangement, which is much more typical of a, of a dicotyledonous plant. Um, uh, and uh, this is one of the few in this group which is actually a dicot. Is, uh, this is uh, amphibious bistort, um, <coughs> uh, uh, and has this herringbone. Uh, uh, whereas uh, the pond weeds, for example, uh, as is common pond weed, you can see that the veins are running sub parallel all the way the, along the length of the leaf. Um, uh, and this one here is frogbit, and I think you can see that it has this very odd circular venation. I suppose it's a, 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 a monocot trying to fit into a, a dicot shaped leaf. And the way you can see the, uh, the vein sort of comes out laterally and then sort of goes more or less parallel with the edge uh, at the end, and very distinctive and, and unusual uh, uh, venation pattern. Uh, when it comes to the water lilies, again, venation uh, can separate them very easily. Um, uh, this is the, uh, on the left, you've got the white water lily, and you can see that the main veins radiate from, this is where the leaf's, uh, leaf stalk is attached, uh, and, and the, the veins radiate, and they, the sub veins start uh, branching out from there at quite wide angle and uh, start joining up, particularly towards the edge of the leaf. Uh, whereas in the yellow water lily, you can see that the veins come out in a herringbone pattern all the way up the midrib, uh, and then they fork uh, at some point, um, but they never actually meet again. They, they, you can see here that they, they don't actually meet, uh, uh, they just remain parallel more or less to the edge. Um, so even if you don't have access to the pliers, they're still very easy to separate the, the two water lilies. Um, so we're into group number six, I think now. Uh, and these are the ones with uh, expanded uh, uh, translucent leaves. <coughs> um, and uh, the leaf arrangement is uh, important in this group again, uh, and the presence of stipules, uh, which I referred to earlier. Uh, and just to show you another one uh, with examples, po uh, pottery come in quite a vast uh, array you, of, of different different species. You have some that have floating leaves, some that have underwater leaves, some that are stringy species. Uh, but they all, in common, have uh, these alternate leaves uh, and these stipules. And that combination, if you see it in any any uh, any case, you know automatically it's a potomac eaton. <coughs> um, uh, and uh, here are sort of three different ones. Uh, yeah. In fact, uh, this is actually showing two parents and a hybrid, just to uh, 
worry you a little bit. Uh, we do sometimes get hybrids. Um, <clears throat> but again, you can see this arrangement of uh, these sort of stained glass appearance leaves uh, uh, and the alternate and they have uh, these stipules. So again, uh, uh, three different sources of, of Potomogeton. Um, another part of this group are the um, Elodea types. The, these are particularly uh, Canadian pondweed and, and uh, Nussels pondweed. Um, which have their leaves in, in groups. Uh, in the yellow deers, they're in groups of three, but there are some related things like um, hydrilla, uh, which tends to have four leaves in a whirl, um, uh, and uh, <coughs> a, a thing called lagrosiphon, curly water thyme, uh, which at first glance look actually the leaves are staggered. Uh, uh, their sort of spiral uh, around the stem. Uh, these are the two most common of, uh, of this group though. Um, and on the left you've got uh, Canadian pondweed and on the right there's Nussels pondweed. And you can separate these quite easily uh, because these uh, Nussels pondweed has much more pointed leaves. Uh, you can see these are very narrowly acute, tip, uh, acute tips, whereas the Canadian pondweed is, is quite a rounded tip. Nussels pondweed is also very much more curly uh, and, and, and very variable in the, the way the leaves are arranged, whereas uh, Canadian pondweed just sort of quite regularly just arches over a little, but it, uh, it doesn't sort of curl right back to the stem like the Nussels uh, pondweed does. Um, also included in this group, uh, you know, we all be familiar with yellow water lilies when it reaches the surface, uh, but it does have this underwater leaf, uh, which looks a bit like lettuce leaves, but uh, is it's quite that translucent texture. Um, uh, so it's also a part of this group, uh, um, <coughs> these translucent underwater leaves. And finally, we come to the last group, which is the uh, uh, expanded, submerged, uh, opaque leaf ones. And this is quite a miscellaneous group. Uh, I'll show you some examples, uh, but uh, the, uh, they sort of, uh, don't sort of hang together. There aren't any particular characters that are, uh, uh, that, that, uh, are, are useful in this group. Uh, so you've got, uh, for example, the stick stamen waterwort, uh, which uh, is grown out, shown out on the mud here, but it will grow happily uh, in a meter of water, and you'll just see these little green discs on the bottom of the lake. Uh, uh, and this one here, there's the flower. It's not a spectacular flower, um, but uh, uh, quite a quite a dinky little plant. Um, uh, water purslane, um, uh, which uh, superficially it's a bit like a, some of the water starworts, uh, but it has these pink stems uh, which are four angled uh, and it doesn't have the notches in the tips. Um, and of course uh, it's got these very different flowers. Um, Hampshire purslane is uh, it's not an Irish species, although uh, there are some cases where it, it escapes from cultivation. Um, uh, it is quite a rare plant in, in Britain. Um, again, it's grown, shown out of water here, but it grows quite happily in water too. Uh, water starworts, uh, I've talked about those a, a little earlier, but they belong in this group uh, as well as in various other groups. <coughs> um, uh, and again, the, the leaves always in opposite pairs um, uh, uh, and have some sort of notch in the tip. Sometimes in these rounder leaves that notch isn't quite so obvious, but uh, Certainly in these narrower leaved ones, there's a very obvious notch in them. Uh, and you do get a number of uh, 
terrestrial plants that get uh, as drowned in the edges and, uh, and they will come into this group too. Uh, here are a couple of examples. Uh, we've got blinks on, on the left here and uh, marsh pennywort. Both of them quite often get sort of drowned in the edge uh, uh, and, uh, and, and might be sort of, they're not really true aquatics, but you're likely to come across them underwater. So uh, there we are. I hope that's made things a little simpler. Um, but essentially, uh, when you have the time, I would suggest you download the keys from the BSBI website and just work through them. Uh, and uh, I, I think you'll find this, uh, this approach of, of just initially dividing them into leaf forms will be a, a, a make the job a, a, an awful lot simpler. Uh, I need to say thanks to uh, the BSBI for organising this, but also to uh, the National Parks and Wildlife Service and uh, 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 Department of Cultural Heritage and Geltecht uh, for uh, providing funds uh, for this. Uh, also to Nigel Holmes, who uh, is sadly is no longer with us, but a lot of these pictures that you've been looking at today are, are his. So there we go. Uh, any questions, I suppose? Thanks so much for that, Nick. That was really useful. Um, I think we've got a few questions come in. There was a question that just came up a minute ago that, that I'm sure you'll be able to answer quickly, but how to tell apart Lemna Minor from Lemna Giva? Um, <laughs> That is, uh, there is some debate about that. It's not quite as simple as, uh, as made out. And I think that there are some people that uh, are saying that Lemna Gibber is a much more widespread thing than people have been thinking so far, because there are certainly times when you, uh, particularly at the early stages where uh, uh, the, 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 I mean, essentially the difference between them is that Lemna Minor is flat uh, and Lemna Gibber has these inflated spongy cells uh, underneath, the, underneath the frond. Uh, but you do get uh, 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 plants, particularly when they're young, where those uh, spongy cells are not inflated. Uh, but uh, if you look under a hand lens, you can often see there is this much larger cell structure underneath. Um, but <clears throat> there are some people that are saying that actually a more useful character is, is the shape, but I haven't quite got my head around that at the moment. So uh, I perhaps not the best person to advise on this because I think people's view is changing on this. Fair enough. Um, also, in asking about lemna, um, do you ever grow on lemna to help identify them? Um, I've never done so. Um, uh, tends to be that you don't need to, uh, although uh, with lemna gibber that may be a, a, a thing to do. Um, and I mean, they're not difficult to grow. They will just Put them in a pot and on the windowsill and the, uh, and they will uh, uh, grow quite happily for quite a quite a while. Um, uh, it's not something I've ever done myself. Um, the usually, I mean, the, the uh, difference between lemna minor and lemna minusa. Uh, if you look up the books, there are things about the number of veins. Um, but they're very, very difficult to see. And usually uh, it, you can do them, uh, separate them by size because they're very often growing together. Uh, and you can see, uh, uh, sort of, it's, it's a bit like those, uh, when you do your eye tests, they, they give you these sort of dot patterns and you, you have to pick up uh, a, a pattern in them. Uh, and uh, with, with, with this, you can usually see that there's two distinct size differences mixed together. 
Um, uh, and there's usually a slight color difference too. The, the lemon minute it tends to be a slightly more matte and a sort of slightly more blue green, whereas uh, lemon minor tends to be sort of more glossy. Um, but uh, it, it can be quite subtle, but it's often easier to do in the field where you've got them both going together. Does that answer that? <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I think so, yeah. <laughs> um, someone was, well, there have been a few questions about uh, resources to, to get going with ID. Um, so for someone who's really just starting out with aquatic ID, do you think something like the Collins Guide, which a lot of people will already have, combined with, um, say, your key, would be enough for someone to, to get started with some aquatic recording? Um, I think probably that, that would work. Uh, some of the illustrations are clearer than others. Uh, um, I, I still think that the Field Studies Council guide, which is not very expensive, is, is still a, a good place to start. Um, uh, and and uh, it is quite easy to use. It, it divides things up in a similar way, I think, to what we described here. Uh, but what my, my keys are actually, designed to fit on an A4 sheet um, so that you can laminate them and take them out in the field. Um, but uh, uh, the, the advantage of the Field Studies Council Guide uh, is that it has illustrations beside uh, the key characters and so you, you have immediately have a picture which illustrates what it's trying to ask you and, and that can be quite helpful when you're, when you're just beginning. Um, there were also questions about whether or not the slides would be made available, um, more details about the books, like the German book that you mentioned, things like that. Uh, so I just want to reassure people that we're going to try and compile all that and, and get that listed on the web page as well, um, so that, that you can access those if that would be useful for you. That's um, certainly the plan. Yeah. Uh, another question. Um, is it possible to get a list of plants that are indicative of different water quality status? Um, yes, there is. Um, there are, um, uh, I mean, the aquatic plants are used uh, in monitoring for water framework directive. Uh, so they do, uh, both in Britain and in Ireland, there are uh, the different, different schemes um, uh, but they do have a scoring system uh, and uh, uh, the British one, which I, I, I know better, uh, they're rated on a scale of, of, of naught, which are sort of acid soft waters, uh, or maybe it's one that starts at, uh, uh, to 10, which is eutrophic and uh, uh, um, uh, highly eutrophic waters. Um, in, in Ireland, uh, the equivalent is a thing called the free index. And again, it, it gives a score to each species, uh, uh, which uh, again shows the, um, uh, so all, all the sort of soft water species will be quite low scoring uh, and uh, the sort of eutrophic species uh, uh, a much higher scoring. And they do some fancy calculations and end up with this, uh, magic answer as to whether the, the lake is in good or bad condition based on, on these aquatic, spa, uh, aquatic uh, species. Um, so I probably my recommendation would be to get hold of those. In, in Britain it's called leaf packs, L-E-A-F-P-A-C-S, uh, and in Ireland it's called the free index. Um, uh, and uh, I, I can try, uh, we're going to put together a, a list of the books that I've been talking about. Uh, I will also try and include that too. Um, uh, uh, um, because I think that's quite a useful thing to have. Sounds great, thank you. Um, there's a question about how important it is to, to get identifications verified and maybe how people can go about that. Do you want to uh, volunteer your services? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm happy to have a look at things uh, uh, until you're feeling more confident. 
the BSBI has a referee system for the more uh, 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 critical things, particularly. Uh, for example, Richard Lansdowne is the, the referee for Water Starworks um, uh, and Chris Preston for, for Pondweeds. Um, should say that the referees are, are available for BSBI members. So if, if you're finding any of this useful and you're interested in getting more involved, please do consider joining BSBI. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> um, uh, so there is, a, there is a referee system. There's also, I think, the BSBI has a, a general aquatics referee, um, or certainly used to, I can't remember if it still still has that, for just any aquatic plants that, that you need help with. But uh, you may also find uh, uh, some of the, some of the local uh, botanists that that, uh, that that can help guide you. Um, uh, uh, won't volunteer their services, but uh, uh, often if you if you talk to a vice county recorder, they may be able to point you to somebody that that uh, that, can, that can give you some help. Yeah, I would I would follow that up by saying if you if you look on our local botany webpage, you'll be able to see who your local vice county recorder is, or you can get in touch with your country officer if you're based anywhere in Ireland. That would be me, um, and they'll be able to help you. We have local groups, local botany groups in quite a few counties in Ireland now, um, so that's something else you could get involved with just to get to know some other local botanists. Um, if you're confident in your identification, you don't need to get every specimen verified. You can also look on uh, the database and see if in the in the hectare in the sort of 10 kilometer area you're you're in if the species you think it is has ever been recorded and if not then then that might mean it's more important that you get that checked uh, if it looks like it's something new or rare um, so lots of lots of support available yeah and and, and anyway um, uh, if uh, if you want to send me pictures, um, I may not be able to answer any, everything from pictures, uh, but I can probably sort of say, well, it looks like what you what you suggested is correct, or no, what, what about something else? Uh, uh, so I'm I'm happy to provide a bit of support in that way. Um, hope I don't get overrun by things, but uh, but certainly. <laughs> uh, uh, there, in truth, there aren't that many people that are prepared to get their feet wet. So uh, I'm certainly happy to encourage that. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Um, and that does bring up the the issue of uh, collecting or what you would need for verification. And you were great at telling us what what you need to do sampling. And <laughs> I've even got my own little uh, egg whisk grapnel here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, very cheap and easy to make. But one other thing that might be worth noting is is the need for magnification in a lot of cases. Yes, a lot of the characters uh, you, you can see under a hand lens. There are a few things that uh, need sort of stronger microscopes. Uh, if you start getting into bladderworts, for example, um, you, you sort of have to, uh, if you're really going uh, for the, the individual species, you, you have to open up the bladders and look at the hairs. Um, and uh, in water starworts, uh, they're uh, quite a useful character is, is the pollen grains. Um, again, you need higher power for that. But for the most part, uh, a normal viewing microscope is quite sufficient for, for uh, identifying uh, pretty much everything. It's just the, there's just one or two examples where you need a slightly higher magnification. And I would say that there's lots of digital microscopes available now if you don't already have a microscope where you can get reasonably cheap things, you know, like this I think was about 25 euros. Um, and I was able to, to get some use the magnification, get some photos, send them to Nick last year to get confirmation of uh, which caraphyte I had. So, you know, look out for resources like that. But it doesn't have to be expensive, but it, it can really help with the process. Yeah. The other thing, uh, I guess, is if people are collecting specimens, there was a question about, are there any resources on, on how best to mount aquatic specimens? 
Yes, I did wonder about including a, a, a bit on that uh, in this talk uh, uh, because the, uh, the, for most things, uh, it, it's uh, the easiest thing is to press them, but uh, particularly with the more floppy ones, if you just plonk it on a piece of paper, you're going to spend quite a lot of time arranging it on the paper. Um, unfortunately, I, I was I was going to set up some pictures for this, but but I'll just describe it. The best thing to do with aquatic plants is to actually uh, put a piece of paper in the tray in the water and then put the plant on top of it again in the water uh, and uh, and basically it will float out in the water uh, with the paper underneath and then if you very gently uh, lift the paper out so that the water doesn't stream off but just sort of gently flows off uh, uh, you, you'll find that you'll end up with a much better arranged specimen um, than if you try and do it just sort of uh, cold. Um, the thing that I would say is, is what you will be left with, uh, what you do then is you put it uh, uh, between your drawing papers um, and it will stick to that piece of paper. So, so when you're mounting it as a, as, as a proper specimen, what you will do is actually mount that piece of paper with the plant on it. But when it's in the drying papers, it will st also stick to what's on top, the, the paper on top. So the trick with that is if you get cooking parchment, if you put, put a sheet of cooking parchment on top of it before you put the drying papers on top and press it, you'll find that when it's dry, it's much easier just to, to, uh, uh, to pull out the, 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 uh, the cooking parchment and you're left with that specimen. Otherwise, you'll be left with trying to uh, carefully pull the, the two sides apart and the bits of it will stick to one side and other bits will stick to the other side. So those, those, those are the, the best tips and, and, and maybe I should set up some pictures to, to show that. But, but you'll get a much better uh, laid out specimen if you actually do it that way by floating it uh, in the tank and then lifting the paper out. That's really useful. And if people are sending specimens to you, what's the, or to another referee, what is the best way for them to send fresh specimens? Or uh, just as you would uh, sort, of, uh, sort of protected by stiff cards so they don't get too bent in the post. Um, uh, and um, uh, much as you would send other specimens to, to other referees, uh, there's, there's no particular difference. I mean, uh, carophytes can be quite brittle um, uh, and might need a bit more care when they're dry, uh, but a lot of them are reasonably flexible and, and shouldn't break up too much. Um, and, and there are, uh, in general, uh, I would say it is that there are some more difficult groups where it's worth factoring things on a more regular basis. Uh, plus, if if you find something uh, that isn't recorded from a site before, that's also worth factoring, particularly if it's uh, an uncommon plant in that area. Um, so it, it, uh, it is quite a good uh, uh, thing to do is to is, is to voucher things. Um, um, uh, and I even though I'm hopefully reasonably expert, I will still voucher on a fairly regular basis just to, uh, it's, it's just reassuring that people can go back later and say, yeah, he, he was absolutely right in that identification. Excellent. And that brings on to what I think is our last question, actually. Even with all your experience, are there any groups that you still find particularly difficult to separate? I would say probably the most difficult group is the water crayfoots. Um, they uh, are very variable uh, and um, the, uh, they're probably actually actively evolving and uh, the separation of the different species is quite grey in some places. Uh, plus there are hybrids to complicate things too. 
Um, so uh, those, those are the ones that I like least. Um, uh, but the other thing to say is that the, you do have to be prepared to say, I cannot identify this to species. If you don't have certain characters in water starworts, for example, if you don't have either fruits or flowers, then you're better just recording it as calitrically spur and not trying to go any further. Same applies to water crowfoots. If it's not flowering um, uh, or if it's terrestrialized, because a, a terrestrial, you can have sort of in rivers, you can have quite long leaved ones, but when they become terrestrial, uh, start having very short leaves. Uh, so the, 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 again, the guidance with water crowfoots is if it's not flowering, ranunculus spur. If it's not, uh, 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 if it's terrestrialized, still let's call it ranunculus spur, even if it's flowering quite happily. Um, so, uh, um, and there are other places, I mean, Utricularia, the, the vulgaris group, you need flowers to separate them. Uh, so do be prepared to just record them as aggregates uh, 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 or just as calitrically spur or, or whatever. Uh, better that than trying to uh, go too far in, in recording and, and, and end up with something that, that's, that's dubious. That's really useful advice. Thanks for that, Nick. Um, I think that was all the questions that came through. I just want to say a huge thank you to Nick for this. A big thanks to Claudia as well for her help behind the scenes answering some of the questions that came through. And of course, thanks to NPWS for, for funding this project. Uh, and hopefully in the next couple of days, we'll have the video posted online in case you'd like to review as well as the other resources on the project website. Thank you, everyone.